June 18, 1947, Prime Minister William Lyon Mackenzie King authorized Cabinet Directive No. 18. With that, the RCAF assumed official responsibility for providing the first organized air search and rescue service in Canada. This directive laid the foundation for what is considered, 50 years later, to be the best, most advanced SAR system in the world. Over those five decades, thousands of military men and women have contributed to the evolution of search and rescue in Canada. They served with distinction, often placing their own lives at great personal risk to come to the aid of others. One such individual, whose career exemplifies the courage, dedication, and hard work of CF SAR in saving lives, is Lieutenant Colonel Keith Trevor Gathercole. Keith Gathercole was always interested in flying. He joined the Air Cadets in Calgary in 1960, where he received a private pilot license scholarship four years later. He joined the Royal Canadian Air Force in 1966 after finishing high school. This took him first to Moose Jaw, then to Portage La Prairie for training on the expediter. The thing to be in the early 60s or the mid 60s was a fighter pilot and uh, I thought I would go in and, and fly jets. I didn't know much about the Air Force really when I joined the Air Force and uh, um, becoming a search and rescue pilot was more of a, a really a happenstance rather than anything that was preconceived in my mind. His first posting was Winnipeg where he flew the C-47 Dakota. Right across the field was a SAR squadron. Fascinated by their missions, the young pilot got involved whenever he could. Most Air Force pilots train and train and train, and uh, they don't really get an opportunity to use the training. Uh, fighter pilots, for example, don't often go to war. But in the, uh, in the SAR world, I found that uh, the training that we did, we were employing it a week later in actual SAR cases, so it was very relevant. And, uh, and of course, when you pick somebody up who is alive and you get them to a hospital and they survive, uh, very rewarding, and uh, the results are, are immediate. And uh, it does give you a pretty good, uh, pretty good feeling to have been involved in something like that. In January 1972, Captain Gathercole completed his search master's course. Less than nine months later, he would be deployed on one of the longest and most media scrutinized air searches in Canadian history, SAR Hartwell. It would be his first mission as search master. Bush pilot Martin Hartwell was flying a medevac from Cambridge Bay to Yellowknife when he crashed into a hillside. A combination of poor weather and pilot error had caused him to drift far off course and outside the prime search area. It would take 31 days to find him. So I really didn't have much of a, much of a background or much of a feel for it other than what I'd learned on the course. And uh, fortunately the course was taught by a bunch of professional search masters who knew exactly what it was that was going to happen to you in your search. And uh, I anticipated fairly quickly the, the number of the issues that were going to happen, not nearly to the extent that they did happen to me, but uh, quite an experience for a, for a young fellow that, that really didn't have a lot of SAR background. And I learned a heck of a lot in that period of time about, uh, oh, just about SAR and about life and <laughs> about the press uh, queries and, uh, and government queries and uh, dealing with the next of kin, which is the, the most difficult part of it. Captain Gathercole received the Order of Military Merit for his work on the Hartwell search. I uh, received that from Governor General Mitchell in uh, 1973. And uh, it's quite, quite an honor for me. On October 4, 1980, 40 miles off the coast of Alaska in dense fog, a Labrador helicopter was responding to a Mayday call. The Dutch luxury liner, MB Prinzendam, carrying over 500 passengers and crew, was on fire. Then the inconceivable happened. The lab started having problems with all its navigation systems. We were sitting there talking about it when uh, our third system, the uh, Amiga navigation system, started to do all sorts of funny things. And uh, uh, I was saying to Casey, I have no explanation for this. This thing is, you know, what's going on here? We're losing our navies. So we, uh, we elected to call an Argus that was over the uh, Princeton Dam at the time and uh, asked for a, a homing so that we could at least steer to uh, where the action was. In the crew compartment, someone noticed uh, the smell of smoke and um, relayed that up front uh, to the cockpit. 
and uh, just as everyone was made aware that the that there was smoke in the in the fuselage um, all of a sudden there was a lot of smoke in the fuselage. I noticed that on my left side down beside the uh, collective my helmet bag area there was smoke billowing out of the floor and I thought I thought at first Jesus my helmet bag must be on fire something is happening I grabbed the helmet bag and I threw it in the back where the uh, where the engineers could deal with it but pretty quickly obvious to me that it wasn't the helmet bag. Now, there was no flames that we could see. We were just trailing a lot of smoke and uh, and uh, the decision was was to make the, to abort the mission that we were on and to uh, start heading for shore. At about that same time the guys in the back yelled at one of the boxes in the back was uh, was red hot and smoking and uh, we were experiencing a, an electrical fire. Uh, we declared a, uh, a pan which is one step away from a mayday. Um, Colonel Gallico, uh, he was a major at the time, uh, briefed the crew to prepare to uh, ditch at sea and we were about 200 miles off the coast. Ultimately uh, uh, with some switches and, uh, and fooling around with the electrical system we were able to, to uh, isolate that particular box and uh, it started to cool off, the smoke started to dissipate and uh, then we were faced with the problem of trying to find our way back to shore. It was his solution then to turn on the ELT and wait for one of the aircraft participating in SAR Prince and Dam to find them, um, establish itself via fire, which in fact I think was a Hercules aircraft. We descended down through cloud and we seen the big Coast Guard, uh, U.S. Coast Guard cutter down below the cloud, which was only about 200 feet. The base of the cloud was about 200 feet. And the Coast Guard cutter knew that we were on fire. They heard the, the radio transmissions and that and they told us not to land on them. They had a big helicopter deck and that's their SOP is not to land if you're on fire. They would push us into the ocean so they told us to ditch alongside and we could they put a scramble net alongside and that was our plan just as we were getting set up to do that and like I said we were about 30 seconds from putting the helicopter into the water and everyone jumping jumping in the water. Um, this American C-130 who was doing bird dog duties up top way up 25,000 feet or something descended right down in front of us confirmed that we were the helicopter on, on fire and that uh, we needed assistance and they flew us back to shore. And uh, He saved that airplane and, and saved the lives of his crew through some pretty innovative and astute decision making. In December 1980, rain had caused severe flooding of the Chuckamus River at the northern end of Howe Sound. The river was the highest it had been in 21 years. The RCMP, concerned about a family living on an island in the middle of the river, with no means of escape, called SAR for a helicopter rescue. There was a big storm blowing around uh, at the time, a lot of rain, heavy, you know, very strong winds and uh, low cloud, that sort of thing. And they called me at home that night and said that uh, there were four people trapped in a, in a house on the uh, Chicamas River north of uh, Squamish and they needed a helicopter. The only way they could get them out was by helicopter and uh, could we go and, and have a look and see if we could get up in there and uh, get the folks out. Basically we went in up the Chuckamas Valley and had a look. It was pitch black, there was no references, it was, it was a, a winter storm. We finally uh, managed to see some lights uh, which turned out to be some RCMP cars at the uh, Squamish airport. The RCMP uh, arrived at the hotel and told us that, uh, or informed us that uh, there was a, uh, things that got worse up the valley. Uh, bridges were washed out now. There was no chance of anyone else getting to these people. And that um, there was the uh, chance of a earthen dam giving way, sending a 15, 15 foot uh, wall of water down the, uh, down the valley. We were able to get airborne and uh, work our way up into the valley and uh, ultimately uh, we found a house with some lights and, uh, and went in and uh, maneuvered a bit. Managed to get two people out and then found out it was the wrong house and wasn't the right people. Uh, we went looking for the, for the four folks that we were originally sent out to find and uh, ultimately found, uh, found their house. As Sartex we, we switched back and forth between the two, two, two members. Mm -hmm. So my, uh, my partner uh, Corporal Craig Seeger, it was his turn to do some hoisting and he went down and uh, talked to the people on the ground. We were putting them into some really difficult situations. We couldn't, uh, we, we wound up having to hover downwind uh, with really strong gusty winds and, and put the fuselage of the aircraft right into the tops of the trees because we were running out of cable. We just didn't have enough length in the cable. And uh, so we wound up uh, with the Sartex going into the water and then trying to swim and walk through the water, waist deep water that was really moving up to the house where the folks were uh, that we were trying to get to. And uh, 
as we were doing this, we were watching, you know, 100 foot, 200 foot trees coming down with the, with the uh, roots sticking out that had been washed out, coming down this flooded river right past us. The father was adamant that, um, that no one needed to be rescued. They'd wait out the storm. We told them, you know, the consequences. And the mother said, well, you know, take my little boy, uh, who was about three years old at the time. So uh, Craig hoisted with the boy up into the helicopter and informed us that the father didn't want anyone else rescued. So uh, Colonel Gathercall uh, uh, said, no, uh, let's go back down and try to convince these people that uh, they have to be rescued. This is their only chance. So Craig went back down. Um, the father again said no one needed to be rescued. The, uh, the mother said that she wanted to go and she walked over to Craig and Craig hooked her up into the into the horse collar uh, and with the baby stuck between the two of them and hoisted back up into the helicopter. And once he was in everyone's settle, then I went down, talked uh, talked the father into uh, re redeciding, and uh, it wasn't a good idea for him to stay down there. And and that uh, we talked for a while and uh, finally convinced him that uh, he'd be better with his family than staying there. And the possibility of uh, being carried away with the flood. So we ended up uh, back up in the helicopter. There were tremendous risks. We all knew the risks, but every man on the crew agreed to do it, wanted to do it. We went out and did it. Um, three of us were singled out for the uh, Star of Courage. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, everybody in that crew uh, deserved uh, at least the Star of Courage for, for what they did that night. As he moved up the ranks to commanding officer of 103 Rescue Unit, then 424 Transport and Rescue Squadron, and finally, Air Transport Group Senior Staff Officer, it was apparent that his superior skills as a pilot were matched by his ability to instill understanding, enthusiasm, and dedication for all aspects of SAR. Colonel Gallagher was a very good communicator um, because of his vast knowledge of, uh, of SAR missions, previous SAR missions that he'd been on and uh, missions that he'd flown with uh, SAR crews. Um, everyone looked to him for, for his expertise, and he was quite willing to pass that information on to anyone that needed it, especially younger pilots. When I just first started working for Lieutenant Colonel Gazzercole, I was uh, flying the Buffalo on a search uh, north of uh, Montreal. And uh, I still hadn't really met him, uh, but I'd heard a lot about him. And uh, he was actually coming in a Labrador helicopter. And I remember sitting in the Buffalo, we were uh, close to the, uh, the crash scene. We'd actually found an aircraft with uh, two persons on board that uh, had died in the crash. And it was, my recollection was it was tense normally uh, in the first five to ten minutes after you, you find a crash site. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. And I remember hearing Lieutenant Colonel Gathercole's voice on the radio uh, as he came in the helicopter. And just the manner that uh, he dealt with things and his, uh, his way on the radio just seemed to calm the whole situation down. Although he has flown over 400 missions, he is equally recognized for his positive impact on SAR operations, plans and policies way beyond the cockpit. These include contributions to the Ocean Ranger Inquiry, work on the Rescue Coordination Center Automation Project, training and operation standards for SAR air crews and the five CF squadrons, participation in the major air disaster exercises and agreements, even lobbying to keep the buffalo at Comox. The thing that impressed me about Keith as a leader, and you see this sometimes uh, in, in people that you admire very much, is the fact that he's, he's very, very focused. Uh, and in Keith's case, his main focus was on the people that were rescued. It's a trait that certainly we all have to a certain extent, but in Keith I, I see this as something that is uh, head and shoulders above any, anybody I've ever seen. This year, the Canadian Forces is celebrating 50 years of search and rescue. I can't think of anyone in that 50 years who has contributed so much operationally, administratively, and through flying skills as Keith Gathercole has. No matter what situation he was in, or what task he undertook, Keith Gathercole's dedication and common sense approach earned him the deep respect and admiration of those around him. Throughout his distinguished career, he has never lost sight of his one objective, to do all he can to save lives. <laughs>